First thing on the agenda is review and vote on the meeting minutes of February 13th. Can I make a motion to approve the minutes of February 13th? I'll second that. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. We um, uh, have on second comments from the public on items not listed on the agenda. Do I have any comments? They, they can be good or bad comments. They can be, you know. Okay, all right. What an awesome team. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Don't okay. identify that voice. <laughs> Um, the third item on the agenda is a public hearing uh, that we continued from last meeting um, on a joint utility poll on Poplar Hill Road, but my information is that that's been withdrawn. Is that, can you shed a little light on that? Sure. When we left the meeting, Keith was going to, Keith and the engineer from Eversource were going to get together and yeah. um, review the poll location and have a discussion about the appropriate placement and um, it was decided that Verizon would withdraw its petition and we can anticipate that Eversource will be submitting a petition in the near future or I think a, a similar layout um, Keith was satisfied with the explanation of the need for the poll mm -hmm. um, and Eversource um, will be in attendance once they submit their petition which we'll have to notify butters again and go through that process but okay for now Closed. All right, great. Well, we're cruising through this agenda. All right, we have some scheduled appointments. Um, first up is uh, Julie and Chris from Nexamp uh, on a right of first refusal. Could you tell us? Um, I'm not sure whether to go to you all or to Brian first, but can you set us up for that, please? Um, I'll set the table, and you guys can you guys can finish it. So there is in your packet. Some information about so it's an amended notice of intent to sub property and convert to other use under MGLA MGL chapter 61a section 9 and this is in relation to um, the Hudkowski property that next amp has a special permit to construct a solar array on mm -hmm. the land is currently in chapter 61a and commercial solar is an ineligible use under 61a so that needs to be um, taken out of 61a and when property is converted to an ineligible use, it triggers the town's right of first refusal mm -hmm. to purchase the property at the um, at the purchase price that's been agreed to. And there's a purchase and sale agreement that was included in your material. Yeah. And um, in accordance with the town's um, in accordance with the town's APR policy, it, it talks about notification to the conservation commission and ag commission of mm -hmm. Chapter 61A parcels that are taken out and provided uh, notification to those boards and they both responded um, and at the end of the day they said that they that they don't object to the to the select board waiving the right of first refusal um, the the ag commission is 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 always conscious of um, agricultural land that's taken out mm -hmm. of an agricultural use um, albeit Temporarily, in this case, um, yeah. consider whatever right. twenty years temporary. Yeah, but yeah, what's your time scale? Um, and the conservation commission, um, I, I guess, shared those that larger concern. Um, but neither one of them had any objections to the, the board waiving that right of first refusal. I don't know if I left anything for you guys, but it's good. You have any thoughts, Fred? Okay, so. Who's going to actually be the owner of the property? So Nexamp is going to own the property. Um, it will be titled Nexamp. That's going to be the owner, or, or some subsidiary, or some other, or is it? LLC it'll be one of our LLCs, a subsidiary. It's called Nexamp Free Holdings LLC. Okay. So originally, this was going to be um, renting the property. Um, and it's changed to the sale of the property. Is that, or am I wrong on that? I might be wrong on the details there. So we're purchasing the entire parcel, and then another one of our subsidiaries, in which we have the permits for the solar project, will be leasing from our other subsidiary. Oh, okay. Yeah. But uh, yeah. But originally, was it not going to be um, 
leased directly from the Hutkowskis, or is that, or am I getting the mixed bags wrong? It was originally, so do you want to talk about yeah. the bankruptcy? Oh, okay. The, the Hutkowskis went through a bankruptcy proceeding, and what came out of the proceeding with respect to this particular property was that Nexam would purchase the property subject to the purchase and sale agreement in your county. Okay. Okay. And the, the uh, access to this property is off of Christian Lane, and Correct. there's enough access there for the property? Yes, that's what the ZBA determined, and it's our only access into the lot. What, what is that width of that access? Um, I'm not sure, but we did speak with an abutter who granted us extra frontage. Hmm. That, would, that would be... Uh, your better, abutter would be Mr. Farrick? Correct. And, is, and if you purchase this property, is there anything in the deed, any restriction that says you cannot sell it to anybody else? So you could do that anytime after if you wanted it. Your subsidiary could sell this to whoever they wanted, right? Correct. Okay, and that's all. Yeah. Basically, I, yeah. I had questions I had. Yeah. We need a motion to waive our I, right for the yeah, I, first right of yeah, refusal. Yeah, I think, but I don't think we should exercise the right of first refusal. I'm sorry. Um, we should let this go forward. Now, I'm trying to remember now, does that mean we are not exercising? We are not, okay, we are not exercising Present. our right of first refusal. Okay. So, would you like to make the motion? Yes, I'll make that motion. Well, we. Town Whaley is not exercising its right of first refusal on this parcel property. Okay, second. Uh, all okay. in favor? Aye. Aye. There is a document to sign. Okay. And I'll send this to you guys once it's notarized. I am a notary. Can I do that now? I guess so. It just has to be signed in front of a notary. Oh, okay. okay. When are you expecting to start? As soon as we get our building permit. Okay. Within so our building permit application is in, and we're waiting for sign off on that. And after that, we can start within the next few weeks. And by the end of the year, you'll be producing. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Was the other one online? The other one yet? It's not producing? online yet. We're waiting for EverSource. Oh, okay. Can I just? Do you guys have your like, driver's license? Yeah. Because I don't know you personally. Oh, well, this is oh, Joyce and this is Brad. <laughs> I know who you are. My mistake. Thank you. Maybe I shouldn't have driven here. There's so many white pieces of paper in my wallet. Yeah, so many white pieces of paper. identification card. That would probably not be because I have a point of ID. Okay. I know I've gotten my driver's license out. No, no. All right. Let's just start this. And just empty everything out here. Oh, here it is. I knew it was. Great. Thank you. So who's who's doing the payback on the 61 A's? Koski's or are you? We are. You are, okay. You got the rollbacks from Cynthia already? I did, yep. Yeah. And okay. then any existing real estate um, taxes on that block will also be paid through the sale. Okay. Okay. Um, can I get another copy? I have another copy of me. Here, okay. You want two originals or you just want a copy? I just want an original to take with me. You guys. Do you want an original or no, do you want me to just take scan? Copy. Okay, yeah, I'll take a copy right now. Okay, right back. great, thank you. Yep. Thank you guys.
so did folks from Waitley subscribe to the, I know we had this discussion, or to the, the facility the, on the COCAS property? That's a community solar project? They did. So when, when would residents ex anticipate seeing, is it credits on their, credits on their bill? Yeah, it's the 30 days after it's turned on by the utility. Okay. And you have a date from Eversource? Not yet. Um, not to my knowledge, but I can email you for yeah. sure. Okay. Could Brian get a list of how many residents, not who, but just how many signed up? I know mine's coming out of uh, Plainfield or something. Yeah. Not that I particularly yeah. care. Yeah, we um, put subscribers on the soonest solar yeah. project that's available, but right. we can definitely get a list of Just how so many we have an idea of how the town did. Yeah, absolutely. Appreciate that. Yeah. That, that'll include all my social security numbers. <laughs> and addresses. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> The credit is the energy credits from the state, not the reduced rate in energy, right? To the That's uh, what we're talking about, the, the community solar credits? Yeah, right. Especially the community solar credits. So are from Eversource. Eversource, they're the solar credits, okay. Right. So okay. they won't show up every month on a bill, it's every, whenever you get the credits, right? From the credits will show up monthly, and then residents will receive a next hand invoice monthly for those credits, effectively 85 cents on the dollar. Okay. Okay. So, like, are we done, or is there more business? We have, we have a copy. Yes, we do. We have your copy. Yes. Yeah. 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 All right. Thank Good. you very much. Drive safely. Thank you. Thank you much. Okay. All right. Get back to Brian on the Zoom out. Um, so, under so all know, business, uh, we've got to uh, discuss and vote to award the contract for the repair of Waitley yeah. Elementary School sprinkler system. This is a real reason why we couldn't cancel this meeting. Yes, yes. yes. Uh, I was yeah. there last yeah. night when they <laughs> were chatting about it at the finance committee meeting. Yeah. yeah. This is the this is the final chapter of the saga of, of the, the saga. Uh, right. Waitley Elementary School sprinkler repairs. Um, the system has been Scope with the fiber optic camera has been flushed, leaks have been repaired, and the final piece is to replace all of the dry pen uh, pendant dry sprinkler heads or dry pendant sprinkler heads, whatever they are. The sprinkler heads, they didn't pass the, the required testing under the NFPA, so we need to replace them all. Okay. And we have one bid from the Hampshire Fire Protection, that's the company who services the system. and. We have enough money, so if the select board would award that contract, we could get the work started. Okay. Um, the, the, the main parts of the project will be um, each drop from the from the sprinkler pipe needs to be measured because mm -hmm. they're all uh, different distances or most you know, yeah. they're not a uniform right. length, so then they need to be ordered and then installed. So and we'll try to work around the school vacations and to have this done um, um, by sometime in the summer. Okay, uh, well I would move that we uh, vote to award the, uh, uh, not the grant, reward the contract for the repair of the Waitley Elementary School sprinkler system to Hampshire Fire Protection LLC. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Next, we have to discuss and vote to award the contract for engineering of the Chestnut Plain Road sidewalk construction project. So in your proposal, you have a packet from Sarah Campbell. She's uh, an engineer. Uh, mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, I've met her on a couple of occasions, yeah. like years ago. Our children were in the same place at the, uh, uh, at the Shea. Yep. Yeah. Um, and you included an extensive resume as well. Um, she worked with the town of Greenfield as the, um, um, the engineering superintendent for four years and many other positions. Um, oh, yeah. Where she provided engineering services. Um, Is a Cornell graduate? And now graduate? she has her own uh, consulting business. And she recent, most recently did the engineering for the, the Complete Street sidewalk work in Sunderland. Oh. And he contacted Sunderland, and they were very happy with 
with the work that she had completed. Um, so there's a proposal in front of us for um, $4,600 for developing the necessary drawings, details and written specs, cost estimates and bid forms, attending pre-bid conference, responding to questions, um, if necessary, reviewing bids. For, so that's all for $4,600. That would get us um, to the point where we have bid ready uh, documents. Oh, bid ready documents, and till we get the bids back from um, different contractors, and then um, I think we can. I don't think we need to deal with this tonight, but if, if we want her to, to do some um, construction oversight or construction mm -hmm. administration services, um, we could do that as well. Um, okay. She was suggesting that would be approximately three thousand um, dollars. So I talked with Keith about this and reviewed it, and he's in favor of of us hiring her. Okay. Um, and so we talked a little bit about money, and he believes that that the chapter uh, it's an eligible expense for Chapter 90, okay. the Chapter 90 funds, and there are there are sufficient Chapter 90 funds to cover that. Um, to cover this cost. Okay. okay. Yeah. Uh, and this is going to be advertised through FERCOG? This contracting um, services. Write a contract document, publish, receive the bids. That's what she recommends. I'm not sure that that's necessary. Um, who else would do it? We would. I think we can do it in house because, quite honestly, once you have the once you have the plans and the specifications, yeah. it's it, it's a little bit it, it's a little more difficult than slapping some pieces of paper on the front of it. But it's not terribly difficult. Okay. Um, we have a lot of that front end boiler boilerplate mm -hmm. language already. And that might that give us uh, an advantage in terms of less delay than going oh, through the FERCOG? Less delay and the FERCOG would charge us oh. probably charge several us. thousand dollars to, to, oh, okay. to do it. If I had to guess. Okay. Um, so we can so we can save a, a little bit on that as well. Yeah. Um, I guess the, the only thing I would kind of add here is that we did get a, a request. I think you must have gotten a copy, Brian, from the Historical Commission that they be, uh, you know, they want to be active cooperative partners to keep the kind of the historic. Yep. Um, I'm going to have the wrong word, but like the historic, not feeling, but like just the actual uh, historical character. aspects and character yep. um, for that historic district. Um, and they want to be involved, and they, they want to do it in a, in a proactive way. And I'm wondering if that would be something that um, means they'd be involved with Sarah uh, in this. It seems like that this would be the time to be involved. Right? Yeah, yes. And uh, I don't know if that needs to be specified in the contract with Sarah for signing that actual contract. Um, and would that need to be specified, or would that be something we can just have uh, as an understanding that um, I think it's something that that we can have as an understanding. Yeah. Um, okay. I'm fully committed to having the historical commission involved. Yeah. Or a representative of the historical commission. If that's how they want to do it. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Well, it it says here on the first page that they will uh, prepare preliminary drawings, uh, sidewalk, crosswalks, review it with you and interested parties prior to finalizing the bid documents. Yeah. So if we have a meeting yep. with the historic commission and whoever else, uh, that would make sense. We could do that, or also at our uh, informational meeting in April, if they're ready to do something, then is that? Yeah, yeah possible? possibly. But, yeah. I'm not sure what what timing is or availability is, but, but yeah, yeah. When Keith, Keith and I, we. Yeah, we had a preliminary meeting with uh, with Miss Campbell at the, at the town hall to sort of go over the previous work that had been done with the Conway mm -hmm. School design, and I mentioned to her that, and I think she knows that it's a historic district, and the input from the historical okay. commission is important. Okay, well, I would um, move then that we uh, vote toward the contract for the engineering of Chestnut Plain Road sidewalk construction project to. To Sarah. Okay, and 
Sarah Campbell, sorry, I should say, Sarah Campbell, uh, Consulting Civil Engineer. Okay, I'll, I'll second that uh, question. Uh, oh, sorry. I second the motion to award it, but uh, do we have someone else to sign to award the contract, or is Keith doing that? Who is awarding the contract? Who's signing the contract? Um, it could be the board. I'm trying to think who approves Chapter 90 expenditures. You the board right. does. The board does. So yeah. this would come back to us as a Chapter 90 expense? I believe so. Okay. So we don't actually sign something tonight. We vote to award it, and then Keith will come with this paperwork, as he often does for Chapter 90 stuff for signatures. I'll, I'll double check with him. Okay. Um, I don't have a contract okay. to sign tonight. Okay. Um, but approving it um, means you can at least move forward. Huh? means we can move forward and get okay. the contract. And if there is a contract, and Okay. Come for signatures if we need them. Okay. Okay. This was technically we also need to vote. Okay. No in favor? Yes. Aye. Aye. Okay. Very good. Well, we are zooming. We are at the fiscal year 2020 budget presentation, expense, and revenue trends. Is that the? That's that one. Yeah. That's the show. I might move back. I think, um, yeah, over there. Easier, though. Um, so it's easier to see. So we tabled this from last time. And yeah, and I, I was disappointed. I, I wanted to, the Finance Committee has seen this, I mm -hmm. uh, gave this presentation to the Finance Committee, so I wanted the select board to see it as well. Okay. Uh, and I'm happy to investigate things further. Okay. You know, it makes sense. So all this will be on FCAT's screen? Um, yeah, they'll be able to see they'll that. They'll be able to see that. Okay. So this presentation was given to the Finance Committee. It's uh, an, over, an overview of the revenue expenditure trends um, since most of these are about 2010, 2010. Um, so first we were looking at revenue trends. There's four main sources of revenue for the general fund. Um, local tax levy, that's our tax collection for uh, tax payments for real and personal property. Uh, we get state aid, that's funds provided to the town by the Commonwealth. The largest categories of state aid are, in terms of the amounts that we receive, our Chapter 70 education aid. I actually amended this, I added the school choice um, receiving tuition after our meeting last night. I wanted to see how that was shaking out. And unrestricted general government aid, and that's what it sounds like. It's money that's given to the town for an unrestricted purpose. Um, local receipts. Our funds we collect, our revenue we collect um, at the town level. So fees, fines, um, fines and forfeits, investment income, the motor vehicle excise tax, um, the enterprise funding and community preservation funds are also considered local receipts, but those are separate from the general funds, so they're not, um, they're not included. And then all other, that's additional funds that are made available as revenue to the town. So that's typically through inter account transfers. When we appropriate free cash, it shows up as revenue, but it's not actual new revenue that the town has, has taken in. Um, so anticipated revenue by source. This is uh, fiscal year 2019, the year we're in. And you'll see, and this is true for you know, every fiscal year, um, the tax levy is the, is the largest source of our revenue for the town. Um, so this is FY 2019, state aid, uh, local receipts, and then all other. Um, in this year, and you'll see later in the slides, this year being FY 2019 and FY 2018, the all other is, is larger than normal, um, really for two things. One in FY 19, um, it's a little bit larger because we see some of the transfers for the town hall project that, have, that took place. 
that inflates that number a little bit. And um, also in 2018, which we'll see later, the transfer um, to pay off the, the loan for this building of nearly a million dollars was also uh, also shows shows up as as revenue. So those are a little bit skewed. Um, this is a local tax levy since uh, 20, uh, 2010. You see it, it there's it fluctuates a little bit, but mostly it it's increases around you know we're looking at between two and three uh, each year. There's some exceptions, but generally seems to be what's happening. This is this is a local tax levy, um, and we're showing excess levy capacity and total value. Excess levy capacity is the difference between the actual tax levy and your levy limit. Your levy limit is how much money you can raise without needing an override uh, or having an item debt excluded. So you'll see that the that the town's excess levy capacity has grown significantly since uh, 2010, and this is it in 2019. So there's been a, a, a pretty steep growth in that. And a lot of that is due to the total value in the town, that's this purple line here, um, has increased significantly um, since 2010. So the levy limit increases every year by 2.5% plus certified new growth. So in years where you're not spending up to um, that amount, the, the excess levy capacity will continue to grow. This is the local tax, I'm um, sorry, this is your excess levy capacity. Um, this is Waitley uh, compared to our surrounding communities. So Waitley has a significant amount of excess levy capacity. Um, and the blue is Conway, red is Deerfield, this greenish, brownish color is Sunderland. Uh, the next one's Williamsburg, and that's Hatfield. Um, the reason why I think this may be important this year is with the uh, the Frontier Capital bond proposal that we have seen, and whether some of our um, partner community partner communities in the Frontier District would be able to uh, take on a project like this. Um, so I think that's one of the reasons why um, we heard Darius say last night at the Finance Committee meeting that it's important for some of those communities that they be, be able to debt exclude it because they are up against the against wall, so to speak. Um, these are our tax rates from 2010 through 2019 um, with a high of 1617, right? That's, that's the high. In 2015, um, so, it, Last this year, this current fiscal year, we're at fifteen fifty-two. So we've been really between you know, fifteen and sixteen, um, and that's um, fifteen and sixteen dollars per thousand dollar of assessed value. This is a tax rate of surrounding communities. Um, you'll see uh, this is so that the one the graph on the left is 2017, 2018, 2019, moving to the right. Most of the communities have gone up during this time period. Waitley has actually um, seen a decrease during that time period, but that's a very small sample size. Um, but it kind of gives you an idea that at least in 2017, 2018, 2019, um, it's, um, at least for Waitley, it's, we haven't seen that increase that other communities have seen. Another important thing to look at is average single family tax bill. And this is um, calculated, so there's a hypothetical average single family house and there's a value attached to that. And that's how you would generate that tax bill. You take the, that total value times the tax rate. And sometimes the tax rate can be a little deceiving if assessed mm -hmm. values are going up. Um, yeah, yes they have been. Yeah, and then, and assessed values go up. Some of the bigger houses have yes. driven up the year. Yeah. So, um, in some years, you'll, you'll see the tax rate didn't go up, but my bill went up. Well, that's because something's happening with the assessed values. Um, so, 
tax rate is not always a certain indicator of, of affordability. Did you look at the mean? I'm sorry. The mean? Well, average is mean, right? No, well, average is... Average is... Average, average is average. Mean median. would be median. Yeah. Median. I don't have that on, on this one. No. Okay. Just curious, because it might be... It might look flatter. Yeah. Um, and this is this is the average single family tax bill. Um, and again, it says our same neighboring communities. Um, and Waitley in 2019 has, I have this listed somewhere, but I don't know if I can find it in time. Um, Waitley had the highest average single family value for houses out of all of the, out of all of the communities. Um, it was about three hundred thirty thousand dollars was the average single family value. Um, I think Hatfield was next, and then I believe I believe Hatfield was around three hundred five, and Deerfield was third. I think was around two ninety. I believe um, in terms of the value, the average value of a single family house. Uh, but again, you'll see there's still there's still an increase. 17 to 18 to 19, with uh, some towns being <coughs> steeper than others. Um, so that really, that's our look at the uh, local tax levy. So shifting to state aid, this is total state aid from 2010 to 2018. Um, this doesn't include any um, aid that's given to Frontier. This is the town of Waitley. It would include Waitley Elementary as well. Um, and you see it, it, it fluctuates. Um, mm -hmm. And in, in the grand scheme of things, uh, every dollar helps, but it's not helping a whole lot. Um, this is unrestricted general government aid. You can see the increases that we get each year are pretty small, um, four or five thousand dollars. This one doesn't seem to fluctuate so much. So the previous one, the fluctuation would have been a chapter 70 money or um, like the some of it could you yeah, have chapter 70 seems to go up oops wrong way um oh, you're about to show that sorry i didn't interrupt the flow that's okay um unrestricted general government is not going up by a whole lot each year um, so when they increase when you hear the when when we hear the, the state talking about oh we're increasing you know, unrestricted general government aid by 3%, well, 3% of $130,000 isn't a lot in the grand scheme of things. This is Chapter 70, Education Aid. Um, so this would just be for Waitley, or Waitley Elementary School. It doesn't include Frontier. Um, and I have, I have a slide later on that will, will compares this to total education expenditures. Uh, but again, the increases that we're seeing are, are not significant compared to the increases that we face in terms of really just um, paying for benefits and salaries. Uh, so and I would say graph that zero is not at the bottom, right? <laughs> and so, so a bar that's twice as big does not mean twice as much money. Correct. Yeah. Brian, right, what do you see for for 19, 2019? Are the trends going to be about the same? Can you tell yet? Or? Um. tell you this is only the governor all oh, for 2019 um yeah it should be here chapter 70 2019 was 262 160. okay how about yeah. the other, the other big jump mm, huge jump what how about the other for other categories for Unrestricted general government aid is 138,760. Okay, so a little more. Um, and then stated total was, let's see if I can find total estimated receipts, 752,566. That's a jump. Close to that high, two, three, four, two. Yeah, and we may see. So what I added just before the meeting here 
gotta adjust my tables a little bit, but I wanted to look at school choice tuition because that was a that was a hot topic last night. Um, so school choice school choice receiving tuition is revenue that we get um, from students who come into and attend Whaley Elementary School from other towns. We get five thousand dollars per <coughs> student plus the cost of any educational expenses, any special education um, expenses. Um, and the column to the right of that is our school choice sending tuition. And I also thought it was important to include that because that kind of paints the, the clear picture. And that's what we would pay um, to send one of our Waitley students out to a different district who elects, who elects school choice. Um, and again, we would pay the same thing. We would pay $5,000 plus the cost of any spe um, special education services. And again, that, that fluctuates as well. The 5,000 has been constant since 2010? I think that's been since the inception of the program. Or whatever you're showing it. Yeah, it's never, that's, every, that's the same. As far as I know, it's never been adjusted to account for increasing education It's at least costs. 2001, that's what it was when our kids started. Yeah. Or, yeah, or even earlier than 1999. So I, this may contribute to the little bit of the fluctuation. Yeah, I don't know if it explains it, explains it all. But, yeah. um, and there's some other ones, obviously, charter school, what's not on charter school tuition sending and charter school receiving, uh, not charter school receiving, mm -hmm. charter tuition reimbursement and charter school sending tuition. Sending tuition is the cost that we pay. I believe we pay full tuition for students who go to a charter school. And then the reimbursement is not even close to 100%. Um, Did they explain yeah. the difference between 18 and 19? It just, those numbers seem kind of traumatic. Between 18 and 19? School choice receiving. More in, fewer out. Yeah. Um, some of it depends on, on well, I'll say the 5,000 would be an even number. Um, so we have to assume that, that the different services that are needed are gonna, the different costs of the services needed are gonna fluctuate depending on, on, on the students that we have. So if, if there's a student in sixth grade who needs you know, who's a school choice student and who needs a lot of services and is out of district, um, you know, there's going to be an additional payment that the town is going to make for that. Um, once that person would reach seventh grade, they, they would probably show up in the front as a frontier school choice student. So those costs fluctuate depending on students that are choicing out and the level of services that they need. This seems to be about the right size to account for the fluctuations in that original graph. Yeah. And I mean, just to kind of roughly looking at those numbers and trying to take the difference. Like 2014 was a big peak year. Well, that's the one where have the most in and nearly the lowest out. And then the very next year, still had about the same amount in, but then more out. And that kind of, it's about the right size. It's uh, like $70,000-ish, uh, or maybe a little bit more. But anyhow, yeah. I think that it just really looks like the, the source of the main source of the fluctuations. Yeah. And it was interesting, Joyce, your point last night was that we have 40, 43 students choicing in currently. And what happens if those seats get taken up by, or if those seats get taken up by Waitley residents, there's less room for choice kids, so these numbers will continue to go down um, if, if that's what happens. And so what, what the school committee was talking about last night is that the school choice money which they used to spend a year, um, a year behind, essentially. Um, they really can't do that anymore, and they're going to be spending the current year's school choice money in that in that fiscal year, in that school year. Um, and I, I think that's a, a product of uh, school choice revenue being fairly flat, if we can call that fairly flat, but um, relatively flat, but the increase in education costs continue to climb. So we, 
each year it can pay for a smaller and smaller percentage of the overall education cost. And the determinants are fine. Yeah. Um, and well, was there any discussion of a regionalization last night? No. No. About the rural spending bill? Um, we'll talk about that next. The, the, the one submitted by yeah. uh, Adam Hines. Well, yeah. Yeah, we'll, yeah, we'll talk about at least one aspect of that. Um, so our other source of revenue, local receipts. And these are things like um, fines and forfeits. Um, motor vehicle excise tax. Uh, I don't need to go by memory because it's on the next slide, but this is this is the event <coughs> since 2014. It's been, with the exception of, of I guess 2016 being high, uh, it's been relatively flat. Um, so this is what makes up our local receipts. This is for 2018. So the more new cars we buy, the better off we are. Um, because motor vehicle excise tax is our largest source of um, local receipts by far. Um, and as we all know, we've got that bill in the mail. Let's see. If you upgrade your car, you upgrade your vehicle, you upgrade your excise tax. Um, so that's the breakdown. Uh, miscellaneous non-recurring is obviously something we, we can't count on. 5% solid waste fees. Um, other excise tax, 6%. Um, that's like the, um, that was partially hotels and meals tax. Uh, but it, it accounts for a, uh, a small portion of our overall revenue compared to the tax levy for sure. And this is all other. So that's, that's the category. Typically it's, it's inner account transfers. So like I mentioned for 2018, um, Revenue of nine—I forget what the actual payoff was—but nine hundred sixty-five thousand dollars shows up as revenue because we moved that money out of the, the cell tower reserve, receipts reserve for appropriation account, so it shows up as revenue on our books, but it's not actual new revenue. That that one account that is sure um, on here. Where does the um, the money we get from the solar farms that already exist uh, through our agreements? So them. does that count as a local receipt or is that somewhere else? Um, two years ago, I would have told you it shows up right here. Oh, okay. Um, DOR um, handed down guidance um, in its infinite wisdom that we can no longer account um, for that money as a payment in lieu of tax, even though that's in a sense what it is. Oh, that was um, like right on the top of it is right on the top yeah. um, and they are now making us um, essentially take our we need to take our pilot agreement we need to take the amount they're paying and our tax rate and we need to we need to calculate the value uh -huh. of what of the total value that would come out and uh -huh. we need to add that to our uh, total assessed value so it shows up as as it shows up in the tax levy. Oh, so it shows up as, no, it won't show up as local receipts then. Correct. It shows up in one of your other hot charts. It, yeah, it's, it's oh, part of the tax levy. Okay, all um, right, okay, thank, thank you. Yep, and that's all other. Um, so expenses, these are expenditures by source. This is for fiscal year 2018. And that's no surprise to anybody. Education was, I'm a little surprised it's exactly 50%, but education was 50% 50, 50 of our budget. That's all of the schools. That's Waitley Elementary, that's Frontier, um, that's Franklin Tech as well. And we didn't have any students at, at Smithville, but they would be included in there as well. Um, so education is 50%, public works is 9%. Um, where am I here? Um, the capital outlay, again, that's. Um, a lot of that had to do with um, what we talked about with um, some money from the um, some money that came out um, and was paid for the town hall project. Um, general government seven, police is four, fire two percent, um, fixed costs is eleven percent. 
Um, that's how our expenses broke down for fiscal year 2018. Um, this is total expenditures since 2010. Um, and that's how they are. So some of these are um, a little bit influenced by the capital outlays that, that we make, um, but it's slowly increasing as we would expect. Um, these are total expenditures and these are this, our surrounding communities again. Um, again, as you can imagine, Deerfield is the highest and um, everybody's kind of kind of creeping up um, as the cost of running governments increases. This is, these are our education expenditures. Um, this is our total education expenditure. Um, is all of them. And you'll see they fluctuate. Um, some of that's based on enrollment and how our formulas calculate and how we pay um, our frontier costs uh, and our costs for Franklin Tech also vary based on the number um, of students enrolled. But it tends to fluctuate. Um, 2013 and 2014 were, we actually spent less money in 2017, less money than the previous year. Um, and also, 2017, there was an overall decrease in our expenditure, but then 2018 was a you know, 6.1%. So, but if you did a moving average, it would be a pretty steady up, yeah. uptrend. Like a three year yeah. average or something like yeah. that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, it certainly would be. But not, not huge. Yeah. So, I, I just wanted to show. I guess just get home the point. This is our total education expenditures. This is just for Waitley Elementary. Um, and so this is total town expenditures. Um, and this is how much we get in state aid. So that we're spending around 1.6 um, 1 million and we're getting just over $200,000 in, in chapter 78. So it's, it really needs to be addressed. Um, that's I guess that's kind of the larger point is that I don't I don't think the state is doing its fair share of yeah yeah because it's based on the chapter 70 formula a formula and have you looked at I don't know if you've got another slide that the uh, education expense expenditures saved by student um, I didn't I didn't dive too deep into into the this specifics we, of education. We here, well, we're spending more to educate students here than other we communities. Could, uh, we could look that up. You know, we could do a comparison of cost per pupil. It's it's readily available on the DESI website. Yeah. yeah. You have to really adjust for special education and yeah, and busing. Uh, about a third of the school budget, ish, uh, plus or minus, is special ed. So, and that like serves only of us, a small number, very small number of students served by that. And then, so it's, it's hard to come up with a fair number, especially with the, um, with our school being so small, the numbers of children getting special ed services changes a lot year to year. So that you would need to take averages over time or find some other way to find a fair way to kind of account for that. Um, yes surrounding areas have the same number of special ed? Well, that it, yeah, they'll, have, they'll have the same sort of fluctuations. So in any given okay. year, you might it might look like, well, oh, this town's doing really great. Educating where for like half the cost of us or something. Yeah. But um, it might not be a fair comparison in that year. Maybe they have fewer special sure. needs students okay. and we had more. And, um, I think looking at Frontier might be a better because it's it's averaging over four towns, yeah. um, and that's so that's. Yeah. And these are our um, fixed cost expenditures. So this is a retirement. These are um, health insurance. Um, those types of costs. And is the re uh, retirement and uh, health insurance for the teachers taken out of this? Nope. That's in there as well. That's in there as well. Okay. So a lot of what's influenced this fairly flat um, uh, graph here is 
if you recall, the Hampshire County Group Insurance Trust, uh, during this time period, uh, really didn't um, pass through any premium increases. So um, we're told and we're, we've been warned that that's not going to continue. Uh, they had a significant amount of reserves, we were told, and as, as their way of, of passing it back to the towns, it, it was through um, zero premium increases. So I don't think we can plan on this trend continuing. Is debt service in there? Um, I'd have to look. I want to say no, but I'm not, not possible. Um, so, so the takeaways, I think, is, uh, these are just bigger picture things. Um, with state aid and local receipts making up such a small share of the overall revenue, um, and it, we don't really see any sizable increases for those items in the near future, the tax levy is going to continue to be the main source of our funding, like it has been. Um, I think economic development and new growth remain key to the good financial position of the town. Um, but we also need to balance growth with other factors such as the appropriate areas for growth to occur in and um, I guess well-planned growth is what I'm trying to advocate for. Um, and we don't really know the effect of the impact fee payments and the tax payments from the marijuana establishments if, um, if and when they open because um, that's based on revenue. So just have to see. I mean, I think we anticipate that um, the shop, uh, the shop that's proposed to open at the Sugar Loaf Shops, would probably open in FY20. I would imagine um, that's at least their plans. So we'd have to see what sort of revenue we get. I would be interested to see what sort of revenue we we collect from them um, against the three percent tax that the town adopted, on top of the um, three percent community impact fee as part of the host community agreement. And then, I guess this was just more of a message to the Finance Committee, that we still have a sizable excess levy capacity. Um, so we don't have any current concerns about an override or, or uh, debt exclusion. Although I, I like to think that we would make decisions that don't shrink our excess levy capacity, because that means we're going really in the wrong direction. Or we're spending above the two and a half plus new growth, and that would—that's how we would shrink that excess levy capacity. For expenditures, um, I still think that the, the the main cost drivers for future budgets will be education, education spending, and fixed costs. I don't, I don't expect the health insurance premiums to stay level like they were for since uh, 2010. Um, we already saw this education spending is increasing at a faster rate than the increase in Chapter 70. Um, so the towns, the town of Waitley, the town appropriation will likely continue to grow. It'll, it'll become a larger portion of, of the overall. Um, it'll bear a larger burden um, to fund the schools. And I think that's happening in most communities. And health insurance and retirement um, is a kind of, but I think health insurance and retirement are, are going to continue to that's sort of the trend in health insurance. And then for retirement, um, our retirement assessments keep going up. And the reason that, that we get is people are living longer. They're collecting retirement for more years. So we need to stay plan accordingly. Um, so just a quick first look at fiscal year 2020, which is what we're planning for. This is the retirement increase that we've been assessed. So 7% um, <coughs> uh, in terms of education. So in the governor's proposal for, for the governor's budget for FY 2020, um, it would, there's a, the charter school tuition payments to be made by the town have been eliminated. Um, so it, as well as the charter tuition reimbursement. So if I'm looking, if we look at FY 19, there was probably a net of about 25, 25 or $30,000. Um, so that's, that's, I guess what we would 
that's the same yeah, exact thing. Okay. So we would lose. We would that be money. paying more. We we would we have a net of paying thirty thirty thousand dollars charters. Um, this upcoming year, we're anticipating the payment of the Frontier Capital Plan, assuming that passes um, whatever thresholds it needs in the in the, the districts towns, and we're hoping to pay a portion of that, uh, at least the CPA eligible portion of that project, which would be the track um, through C with CPA funds, and that's going to be um, one project on the public hearing that's coming up for the CPC, I believe. Um, we're getting rid of our debt, Neil. So forty-seven thousand dollars in debt service payments are coming out the books. That was that was the final payment on one of our highway department dump trucks. We still we're still paying. It's going to be eighty somewhere between eighty-two and eighty-four thousand. Um, I think for the next two years, and that's for the the fire truck that we had most recently purchased. Um, and this this does include the CPA back debt. This is looking at general fund debt. Then ocean, the unknown right now is the ocean compliance costs. Um, municipalities are being are being uh, required to comply with OSHA, so we're trying to get through that process and see what that will entail. New revenue possibilities: marijuana taxes and impact fee payments. We'll, we'll need to see what that is. Next, amp solar pilot payments. This is in year one that we will collect over the term of over the 20-year terms of both agreements. It would be about a million dollars in revenue. I think that's what we had agreed to. And there's also a tax on short-term rentals, um, but I, I'm not sure that will be a, a huge amount of revenue coming in. And this is where we are for our um, free cash and stabilization accounts. Uh, currently have six, uh, $672,000 in free cash. And in our stabilization accounts, we have 362,000 in general stabilization. Capital stabilization is 184, 185,000. In the vehicle stabilization, we have just over fifty thousand dollars. Yeah. I was um, certified for. I thought we had like eight hundred or something. Well, we spent some of it. Okay. <laughs> so that would that would have been certified in um, at the beginning of the fall, and then there were some appropriations and some special town meetings that reduced that a little bit. Um, and if you guys, these are two really good websites that DOS operates, Division of Local Services. One is the Municipal Data Bank, um, and then the other one is Municipal Finance Trend Dashboard. And those are really good places to get um, a lot of information on non municipal finances of, of Waitley and all 351, I think, towns. But that's it. Have you looked at? Uh, your expenditures, you had the pie chart by, by different town offices and functions. Have you looked at that when it's surrounding communities to see, say, what a percent of budget goes for fire or police or fixed costs or whatever to see whether we're in a ballpark? Or? I started to do that. Um, I didn't include it in this presentation because no. um, some some of the ways towns account for different um, different items, it's hard to compare because some. So, for instance, our fire. So, our fire department does include EMS service. So, we couldn't really compare to uh, a community that that includes both of those. Um, so, I, I started to do that. Um, I started to do it. On some of the on some of our departments, and um, I found that it was difficult comparisons to make because we'd have to know I'd have to know more information about um, each community. Okay, I'm just curious. Yeah, I know each community. Uh, you got your different, different unique things that they pay for, and a different population, different size, and all that. that it's going to affect the, your expenditures. Here. Yeah, on that same subject. Something is quite misleading in Deerfield. If you're in the fire district, and the sewer district, you get additional taxes per year. Brings that we have a unit there that's close to eighteen twenty-five thousand. They're showing fifteen something. Yeah. 
and right. Same tax rate. I should have said, yeah, yeah. Deerfield yeah. doesn't include a fire district or. Yeah, we're um, up to 18 something. Right. Deerfield. So, yeah. Um, yeah, someone told me it pretty much wipes out any difference between their um, the stated per thousand rate yeah. and what uh, other local towns have in their, in their taxes. Yeah. I, I think yeah. even their stated rate. Yeah. I think it actually. I think it actually surpassed lately in fiscal year 2019. Yeah. Um, um, yeah. The thing that um, struck me the most was that all through the all through the 2000s, east, you know, when um, when we moved to Waitley in 1995 and slowly got involved more and more, and in the 2000s, east, we, like when we were starting up um, FCAT and the public access, and I was I was the one behind the camera shooting all the finance committee and selectments meetings. Um, every year, we were right up against that levy limit. And there were years when they had to find $30,000 to cut so that we wouldn't have to do an override. And that's, uh, and, and one of those years was the, uh, we, we had to say, right, employees have to pay a little bit more of the health insurance. Um, it was, uh, the, so, and, and it looks like through, up through around 2010, 2011, the early years of this, that was still true. But that uh, in between there, between roughly 2012, say, and 2018, um, we've actually gotten some breathing room, which is really good. Now, I'm glad I didn't know that when we were negotiating with Nexam because I said, we need to. Yeah, right. I was able to pound the table and, and get us a better deal because of that. But um, but that was true for a long, long time. Yeah. Um, and in, through the 90s, we didn't fund, we funded very little capital that wasn't, like the roof has already fallen in. We need to replace it. Yeah. Um, and so I think that's, to me, that's the really encouraging thing. I mean, I know everything is still going up, um, but there's at least that one area. Oh, we never had six hundred thousand dollars in free cash uh we, it was, it was if we had two hundred thousand we were like that was good you know um and and so in that sense i i see improvement over that particular time period for the kind of the financial footing of the town yeah and it doesn't mean take your take your eye off the ball or anything i'm not trying to say that at all but well, i hope we wouldn't yeah i agree with you because uh, I don't think good times will last forever, so. That's, yeah, yeah, so that was, I really, uh, I thought that was a nicely put together presentation. I looked at the slides last week, yeah. um, so uh, I, I kind of, I was, uh, anyways, so I'm really glad you put that together. Yeah, I'll, I'll second that. I think that that was a very good presentation uh, of our finances and expenditures and whatever. It's good to look at that after, after a while to see whether we're going, see what the trends look like because you lose track year to year of what you're looking at, whether yeah. we're yeah. coming out ahead or not. I so. think, yeah, and it helps us understand yeah. what, what is the problem really. Um, yeah. and, and having that, that data is, uh, and having it put in uh, a way for people to understand it. So people come in and claim, oh, we're, we're doing such and such and so and so. We can say, well, actually, um, you're right about this, but maybe you're not right about that, and and that's really great. Yeah, it, it, yeah. I'm a big picture kind of person, so it helps me to. Yeah, it's a good, yeah. good, good effort, good exercise. Yeah. Okay. Well, if there's no okay. more discussion of that, then why don't we go on to new business then? Okay. Okay. Um, we uh, should discuss and approve the proposed special permit, special event permit application. We talked about that last meeting about having a draft or something like that. Yeah. So there's some interest in, and there's some events that are being held in town. Yeah. Um, one of them we talked about last time in relation to something else, but the Western Mass Father's Day Marathon. And there's an event, the, the Black Birch 10 Miler, Black Birch Vineyard 10 miler, uh -huh. um, and it, and we had, um, you know, a discussion last year after the Mother's Day marathon about communication and lack of communication, um, and it seemed to me a, a good way to, to to 
make sure that communication is happening is to um, require that an applicant who wants to use um, the public way um, or you know other open space that not already in, under the control of another board, like the library is going to figure out what happens with the gazebo. And, you know, Hurley he feel that's under the Recreation Commission, but any other type of open space or the streets that we require, um, whoever wants to use them for an event, just to fill out a simple application, yep. um, give us the date, the time, the type of event, um, estimated number of people, um, give us a, a layout of where the event's going to happen, you know, road race, where's it going to go, um, you're going to have porta potties, you're going to have, you're going to have food, you need a board of health permit, um, and it just seemed like a good idea to have these details known. When I sent this off to uh, Zach Smith at South County EMS, he mentioned that uh, he called himself sort of the third wheel of the of emergency services, and he said nobody communicates with them about this type of stuff um, in any of the towns. Um, so he was he was excited to see something like this happening. Um, he made the comment that. I said, well, how do you find out about these events? He said, well, dispatch tells us that you, know, you need to respond to the finish line of X event because somebody's, you know, somebody's fainted or something. Oh, I um, so, well, and, anything to get on Zach Smith's good side is okay with me. Right. Yeah, you definitely want to. Um, you don't want to. You don't want to see him though. You don't want him showing up at your house. I, I don't, right? No, no. I just want, I just want to be on his, um, on his good side. You know, so it would require the applicant to fill out the application and then go and get, as it's done now, to get the signatures of the police department, fire department, South County EMS, uh -huh. highway department, board of health. Um, it, the highway department, I think, is important. I use the example of there's a cycling race that comes through here. Um, right. And they set up a water station here. And, um, you know, if that road was just chip sealed, we probably don't, yeah. cyclists probably don't want to go on that. Or if there's big potholes in the road, you know, someone might want to get out there with orange paint and, you know, make sure people aren't, you know, stepping in them and, and hurting ankles or anything. So it's really just about communication. I don't know that there needs to be a fee. Um, we could go through that process if we felt like we needed to. Um, for instance, the 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 Blackbird, the people from the Blackbird 10 mile race had had talked with had talked with Chief Savini, you uh -huh. know, and he would, he asked them to provide or pay for three private police details at different point points along the course. So I mean the communication happened with, okay. with the with the police chief but not really <coughs> with anybody else. Um, I see. So it it's just meant to be a, a simple process. It would require um, an insurance certificate, and for most people, that's not a problem because they're getting right. yeah, that would name the town of Whaley as an additional insured. They're getting insurance anyways, yeah. Um, so it's not a burden to ask them to list the town of Whaley um, because they are using our facilities, so to speak, you know, for the <coughs> Sorry. Um, I thought it was a good form. Uh, I like the like it, was, like it was very simple to follow and it was really clear and then at the end you actually put all the contact information so whoever is doing this is like okay well here, let me call the fire chief and I th think that would that was very nice you didn't have to do that but that I think was a good addition and I don't know if that was Amy's idea or Brian's idea but whoever's idea that was we borrowed, we borrowed it from another town. Oh, steal from the best, I say. So I would... Um, steal from the rest, maybe. <laughs> um, so, uh, Fred, how about you? Do you have any comments? I have comments? some comments here. Uh, first off, can this be done electronically so people don't have to go visit these departments? Can it be set up that way? It, Amy and I were having a discussion about this today. Um, and I mean, they could possibly because this um, will this will be available on their website somewhere right and we would make it available yeah the whole yeah. thing but but to respond to these other people all these departments can it seems that <coughs> it would be more efficient to do it electronically than having somebody go visit them or 
I mean, I would be okay if if I was to get an email from Jim who said I talked with so and so, so, and, so yeah. and I'm okay with it. To me, that to me that would be fine. In lieu of an actual signature, right? On but that exactly, right. Piece of paper. just I just want to know that that conversation has happened. Right. In yeah. that he's issued the approval. Um, yeah. And I, what, what we're trying, what I'm trying to avoid is putting the workload on us to do it because yeah, right. we really don't have the, the right. time or the resources to do it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I don't want to have to right. have them send in an application and then myself or Amy have to, yeah. you know, call the police and call the fire. Yeah. So. Well, but is there a way of sending it up online where where the police chief can sign off? At, at a, you have it as an active document, so we can sign off. The board health can on sign on our website. Yeah, oh, we'd, have to act, we, we'd have to or ask our. Not. Uh, you can't do that. Our provider and see what they can do, but I don't know. If do we have the the ability to make it a fillable form? Well, yeah, that's. And then, uh, then it gets then I could, or excuse me, then the applicant could. Because mm. I don't know if we're able that to. That do that. Only costs about a hundred bucks. Yeah. Yeah, because I people have sent me PDF forms that were fillable, and I could add a signature and that sort of thing to it. I've seen that before. I don't know exactly how it works, but it's yeah, it rocket science, right? I do think we can get an old form of Adobe Acrobat. Yeah, I think it's not expensive. Yeah. Okay. The other uh, two other comments. Uh, one was the, the hours operation. We, we've got other other uh, agreements we sign, like town hall and, and other special permits in town hall. We limit the, the hours of operation from 7 a.m. to 10 p.m. I, I I guess I like to see something like that in here to say that at whatever event you have has to be between them hours. I, I, just to project ourselves and, and just, you know, somebody's on, on, I guess you don't know what can happen after 10 o'clock. And, and, okay. Well, we don't have to approve an event. I mean, if it's, if we don't like the, I mean, no, they but there's, the hours in. But you're not saying, well, I don't know, does it say hours in? Yeah, yeah, it says uh, event, set up date and time, break time. down date and time. Uh, okay. Ma'am, I'm just uh, trying to think of something like, or event time. What are the? I don't remember what they're called. They're the the breast cancer walks. Yeah. That go all yeah. night. Really for life. Really for life. Yeah. Or something like that. Or there's some there's some road races that that I've heard about that are like. I don't know what the, what the proper term is, but they're like day long relay races. And uh -huh. uh, I mean, I think there are events that may happen before then or that may go beyond that but i don't know yeah i mean it, it seems like they've got to tell us the time here well, and then we have the final say that's the other thing i like is we have the final okay. say okay the other Probably thing that's right it's the final say and it, the other thing is you've got your placement of collection of signs traffic control devices barricades uh i suggest within say 48 hours time period. I guess I've seen signs up for a week or two of some events in town, even town sponsor events. It, I, I think it just doesn't look good. Even Porta Potty, if they're putting one out here, I mean, do we want it here sitting all week? <laughs> Whatever, I, I think we yeah. should have a time period within 48 hours, 24, 48 hours to Remove anything that they put on town property, say. Yeah. Yeah, so that would be like on page. Well, you, well, you, you got some of the bullets on page three there, whether you want to put it in a bullet. That map, you yeah, well, those, map. those bullets are talking about an event map. Well, I don't, right. well I don't know if that's a place or we somewhere could just, else. We could, we could just add something underneath insurance requirement. Yeah. Like maybe a new section that just first. Something that talks about clean up or removal. Clean up and removal of stuff, yeah. Right. 
and then I actually I don't know what the issues would be with porta potties. Like it might be. It, it, I don't know how strict we want to make it, but maybe we should say part of the plan needs to include say when you're going to uh, you mm -hmm. know put up and remove yep. signs. We can say that should be part. Maybe that would make it part of the event map and site plan to say plan needs to include. Uh, Okay. When when will things? Because I don't know if forty eight hours is reasonable or not. I don't run a porta potty. They, they uh, come. Never out, they to. come every day. I see them my day yeah. every day of the week. Like, yeah. So so maybe twenty four hours is or forty eight hours is not uh, unreasonable. No. Um, but we we could it could be a little more subtle, and we don't have to decide on a time period if we say you need to include a uh, a plan in your plan something about removal of signs. And right. Yeah. Litter pickup. We all know what happens at water station right. after water stations. Yeah, you can do that. Yeah. Yeah. Whether yeah. plan for doing that or whether you want to, we want to say an hour is a time period. I don't know. Yeah. Because because in the end, whatever plan they have, we have to approve. So if we don't right. like the plan of we're just going to leave all the paper cups out there, yeah. then we can basically say. Uh, or we, you know, if the, if the plan is a porta potty, I mean, I don't mean they'll think about it too, right? And that they would follow up on getting those yeah. things taken care of. Okay. We could do so, it that way. Yeah. So if we, uh, with that one addition, um, like that. I would move that we accept this or uh, adopt, uh, approve the proposed special permit, special event permit application. Okay. Uh, I second that. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. And, and you'll also look at the online signatures? Yeah, we'll put other ways to, to obtain Possible. the signature. Yeah. Um, we just want to, again, the, the goal is... Yeah, the goal is not to put <laughs> more burden. The, the goal, goal is to just make sure that these departments are satisfied that it's going to be a, a safe event. Right. It's about public safety, really. Right. If there's, you know, if there's questions we got back, we we went ahead and asked Black Birch to uh -huh. try to do this as a trial okay. trial run. Any questions we got back were, you know, are the road closures? Um, you know, Zach was interested. They they said that they were going to have a uh, what do they call it? An Not a medical station. station, an aid station. So we wanted to know, you know, is that does that mean you have somebody there with first aid kit or? Or you yeah, have an yeah, EMT or something, so and then we're gonna have an EMT. So it's just important things that yeah. these people want to know. I'm sure if, if they have to drive there, it's good to know that there's an EMT there, um, or how to get there. Okay. All right. Okay. Zooming through the new business. Um, next item is to discuss and vote to appoint Jonathan Edwards as the Recreation Commission representative of the Community Preservation Committee. Um, I don't know how much discussion is needed. I think that would be a great role for John to take on. How'd you get him to do that? I don't know. I was going to say, how did anybody get him to say he would do it? Um, but maybe that's why he's not here. We're going to vote him in while he's not here and can't be well, here to protest. Is, is this recommended by the, the CPC? It's up, to the, it's up to the Recreation Commission. It's up to the Recreation Commission to yeah. appoint somebody and then you'd have to affirm it. And you guys don't object anyway, right? We have been desperately looking for a rec commission member for five that years. That was my understanding, yeah. But I would, uh, uh, I would move that we appoint John uh, as the rec commission representative to the CPC. Okay, second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. So are, are all your positions filled on the CPC then with this? All right, excellent. Um, next is uh, probably another quick appointment. Discuss to vote and vote to appoint Dar Darcy Tozier as an at-large member of the Capital Planning Improvement Committee. So, so the Capital Planning Improvement Committee has two at-large vacancies currently that we're trying to fill. Um, Nicholas Jones, who's a member of the uh, committee, had spoken with Darcy and Darcy came to talk with me to get an idea of what, what would be asked of, of members of that committee and she has agreed to be appointed to that committee. 
committee if the select board so chooses. What do you think, Fred? Okay, I'll make a motion. Appoint Darcy to the at large member of the Capital Planning Improvement Committee. I would second that. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Maybe we move up E. E. For yeah, duty or let's okay. definitely do that. Uh, he sh he probably should have done that 20 minutes ago. Um, so uh, the, that item is discussed. They proposed bylaw changes, and we have Judy Markman to help us with that. Do you have a handout? Yep. Page. The planning board is recommending two changes to the zoning bylaws. Um, <coughs> the first would be to try to facilitate adaptive reuse of historic buildings. Um, and I think I explained earlier to you guys that uh, the original impetus of this came with the E school or the Blue School, which the proposed use is, is not allowed under our current zoning. And this Planning board is does not favor what we call um, spot zoning. We don't like to, if we can avoid it, to design a bylaw for a particular plot of land. It, it's inefficient and not in the best interest of the town. And we realize that there are a lot of other buildings that potentially sometime might might need this and the center school is an obvious example but looking forward someday it could be the library someday it could be the church someday it could be the Waitley Inn I mean there, there are a number of large buildings historic buildings the common denominator denominator that most of them have is that they're on they were built a long time ago. They're on non-conforming lots. The lots are small. They don't necessarily have adequate parking. They, they're difficult to squeeze into our zoning. And most of them are in the ag res zoning districts. So they, they start as just being zoned for, they may be grandfathered for say municipal or religious use, but you try and change them and they're just in a district that's for housing and farming. So what we're trying to do is to create a bylaw that will help make other uses of these uh, easier to accomplish without opening the floodgates so you get shops or multifamily housing in every building in town. And so what we have come up with, and we, Joyce was there last night, we have Peggy Sloan at FERCOG, who's the chief planner there, helping us. We would apply this to buildings that, first, the Historical Commission determines to be of significant historical importance, not just historical, but these really matter to the town. And that they've been open to the public in some capacity for at least 50 years. So. So um, this isn't every house or every barn. Right. And there are a lot of important barns and houses in town. But um, this adapted reuse would require a special permit from the ZBA, which means that they get input from the neighbors yep. and from the other people in town, the other boards in town, <coughs> and site plan review, which also means that you're required to check with the Board of Health, the Conservation Commission, and the Historical Commission. Um, it would allow it in, in AGRES 1, which are the agricultural residential districts close to the street, and the commercial and commercial industrial districts. Um, it would not be allowed in AGRES 2, actually none of the ones we envision are in AGRES 2, or in the industrial district, and none of them are there either. Meaning this building would probably never qualify. Um, it allows, by and large, it allows uses that you can already do with a special permit in, in these districts, um, sort of. 
uh, municipal use. The one exception is small retail, and here we're thinking things like antique shops or or small stores that would be appropriate for for the neighborhood. A lot of these properties, obviously, are in Whitley Center. Uh, professional offices, eat-in restaurants, which actually is already allowed in Niagara as well. I'm thinking small cafes or coffee shops, uh, artisan studios, or multifamily residential uses. What this does is allow the ZBA to waive dimensional requirements. So that's frontage and acreage. Uh, Multifamily now for every additional unit requires an extra half acre of land and an extra 75 feet of frontage. Um, ain't gonna happen. It allows uh, what we call last night some wiggle room in parking requirements. Um, you're, you're to try to apply the basic standards, but if you absolutely to the extent feasible is, is the phrase that's used in the bylaw. It does require you to have adequate septic. It does not allow additions except if you need, you know, like handicap accessibility or an ex extra exit or something. You know. And it does require all the necessary licenses and approvals. So if you, you do something like a restaurant that needs health I think what we have done here is the same thing we did with the marijuana, is hand this back to the ZBA and say, use your judgment. Um, the basic control here is probably the parking limits. These are small spaces. Um, Even more so than septic? I would guess so, but... Okay. I, I'm not an expert in that. I can't. The two together, obviously, are, are an issue. Um, and I think the CBA has a good track record of being responsive to this sort of thing. We have deliberately not imposed specific limits because flexibility is, is the key here. Yeah. And um, our, the way we've been thinking about it I think this would apply to the East School, the Center School, the Library, the Post Office, the Town Hall, Wheatley Inn, the Church, and the West Wheatley Chapel. It would probably also apply to the Wheatley Diner, which is a really incredible historic building, and the Antiquarian Bookshop. But both of those are already zoned for commercial, which gives them a lot more flexibility than this has anyway. So, and neither of those is really suitable for multifamily. Sure. Some of them are private, they're not public buildings. Yeah. Yeah. Some yeah. of them are private and that's deliberate. So you're limiting not just to public buildings. Yeah, we are not limiting to public buildings, we're limiting to important historic buildings that are important to the history of the town. And who's gonna who would determine that historic commission? Yes. And do you have guidelines for that? Well I think that's up to them. I don't think you write that in. But do, do they, is, is there guidelines that exist for that to determine? I don't think so. Not to my knowledge. There's the ones, there's a few other buildings come to mind. You've got the general store in Whaley there that's been there for years. That, that actually, I suspect, has more options. We talked about that. That's not acreage constrained. They don't need this. Well, that other use, maybe. I'm not going to say. Um, well, that, that could be, um, we could put it, you know, it could be that that comes under this, but they could, that's already got one apartment in it, they could convert it to a lot of things there. They could also apply for a, they've, they've had variance, I mean, they've got a variance for off, for professional office buildings there now, so they're kind of there already. Yeah. Okay. This is really designed. The, this is really designed for space constrained, uh, parcel constrained buildings. Well, if it's not a building, if it's property like to my own property, is this going to apply to that? No. I think it's just for building reuse, right? Building, just building, building, just building, building reuse. reuse. Okay. Are there any standards about 
lighting or screening or any of the, uh, I guess, environmental that would or aesthetic? In the, in the site plan review. I mean, that's okay. the standard site plan review. Would apply. Okay, because, yeah, I'm just thinking the, these are buildings that are located in yep. existing residential they're, areas they're, and they're everything's I, tight, so everything's it seems tight. more important that. I was thinking, I think most of these uses might be. Controls. Most of these uses might be less intrusive than the ones that are there now. Okay. Like, you know, a restaurant in a dumpster can yeah, no, not smell I'm great not. during some times of the yeah, some times of the year, and if it could be screened, and so there's the ability to. Let's say you put four that. housing units in the church, it would be a lot better than having a few. Yeah. I, okay. So this would be a, a new uh, section in the bylaw. Yeah. And what would this be in the? In the table of uses somewhere with this, all this? Yeah, there's going to be a line on the table of use. Um, it would be under commercial uses. Okay. And let's say special permit in Agris 1, no in Agris 2, special permit in commercial and industrial and commercial and no in industrial. Okay. It, it's, is there a list other than what you've identified here of the historically important buildings in town? I don't think you have to look forward. I mean, this is this is the ones we're thinking about now. Ten right. years from now, it might be a different list. I know, but today people may ask, "Well, what is this?" Well, that's thing? that's that's the best yeah. list I have. That's the best what you have here. Okay. And it doesn't matter if they're on a what, historic register. For what state or federal? No, important to the town. I mean, there are other buildings. Again, it's we're, 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 we're the trusting to the historical commission to to determine. They've already determined that the school is very important to the town, and and I know they feel that way about the center school. But, but you, the town has got certain historic districts, like say in the center town, there's one. Does that mean everything in that district? No, it doesn't. It doesn't, and, okay. And last night, um, Peggy Sloan, she drafted some wording for us and she wanted to put the Mass Historical Commission as a guide, a screen for determining importance. And I. We objected because their standards are anything in the district. And, you know, to me, a well, I'll use an example. A ranch, there, there are several ranch houses in the Waitley Center National Register District. Many of them were built in the 50s, they're 50 years old. Mass Historical Commission would consider them a quote contributing building to the National Register District because they're 50 years old. Um, I don't think they're of the kind of Im historical importance that this bylaw is intended to mean. We're not trying so, to make a, a, a 50 year old. So house. we're really saying significant historical. I think the, the word there that's important is significant. Uh, it, it depends on how you define I mean, it could be because of age or because of, uh, what I would say, architectural features. It could be because somebody yeah. really important lives there. Uh, yeah, or that, yeah. Huh? yeah. Um, but what, what role would the Historic Commission have in this? They have to determine, if they don't say it's significantly historical, this doesn't apply. Okay, so that would be a sign off on the... For ZBA is, to add. The two sign up, the two eligibility criteria even to be considered are that the historical commission considers it of significant historical importance right. and that it's been open to the public for 50 years in some manner. Okay. And then the ZBA decides. But without that, it
I got to ask lots of questions last night, so I have more questions. Did you anything that would be useful to tell? Oh, um, I think yeah. Judy summed it up nicely okay. there, and um, having this list of uh, buildings is, I, I thought, actually important um, as examples. And to to me, the, the nice thing is, is they identified the places where reuse of those buildings would be problematic because of primarily uh, parking and kind of other non-conforming features of the lot. Right. So um, it's not just saying, oh, you can do anything. It means go do a site plan review, go do the, your special permit, and there is another appointed board there, the ZBA, that um, will actually get to actually have some input. So we're not, it's not like a free-for-all, you can do anything you want with any of these properties. It's you still have lots of review, but you're giving those boards a little bit more flexibility than they currently have on the things that are problematic. Um, and you don't just give them carte blanche to be free about everything. It just requires adequate septic. You're not backing off on health laws, right? Um, you're not tying up their hands by saying you, you can't put any additions whatsoever, but let's, you know, for egress that you may need emergency egress to be um, to make the place uh, you know safe and approvable um, so that's what I like about it that it's not just saying yeah go ahead it's yeah I'll go ahead and we're not going to be quite as um, our, our hands won't be so tied on those kind of issues like the, uh, the non-conforming and the, the parking because we don't you know in 10 years maybe nobody's gonna well nobody's Fewer people will own cars because you can get places by uh, by Uber or by other methods. Sorry. So so allowing them the flexibility, I think, is actually appropriate. Uh, just giving away a whole bunch of stuff. So. Okay. What are the next okay. steps? For this, for this bylaw. Well, the bylaws, there'll be a public hearing on the 26th of March, yeah. and then they get voted. And then the select board, and then presumably they go to town meeting. So we're on track to get this to the April annual town meeting. So um, guys like so what changes? Yeah. yeah. Um, what? Uh, Date is the public hearing for this, just so that 26 of March. So March 26, it's going to be here at the town offices or at the town hall. Here. So here at Sandy Lane at seven o'clock, ish. Seven fifteen. Seven fifteen. Seven fifteen. March 26, right here at Four Sandy Lane for the uh, public hearing. So that's the place to ask all your questions. Okay, or, or the other thing, April 8th is our other. And then there'll be up, and there'll be another informational it could be meeting too. I guess. Yeah. Could be that the informational time. meeting though is going to cover a whole bunch of topics, not just the, not just the. Zone. We have to get so. the wording down before the, before the warrant. We have yeah. to get the wording yeah. to town council. Yeah. So in advance to go through of it. the warrant being yeah. signed, so April eighth is too late for. Right. I think for. Yeah. But it would for be a, just another opportunity for people to ask questions about something. Yeah, of course. Is that, yeah. So do surrounding communities have something like this? Are you aware of others? Peggy Sloan um, gave us some input from Buckland, but I don't. Um, I'm, I'm aware of other communities who have. Others have. Thanks so much. Yes, yeah. Well, you see it frequently for uh, communities that are trying to deal with old mill buildings. Town of Lee has something. I think Williamstown has something. Yeah. Each each town is unique depending on the way their their zoning works. Some some towns have village zoning that allows a lot more commercial and small lots than we do. Okay. Do we want to talk about the other one too, or? To you. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, because I, I mean, I read it because I came to your meeting last yeah. night, and there's basically there's a, a bylaw to just make it clear that 
any short-term rentals basically are subject to the bed breakfast laws. Essentially, this, this is that, kind of tied into the Airbnb, uh, right? Hotel or the use tax, and also th this is an attempt to update our bylaws to take account of the fact that a lot more of this stuff is happening on the web, yep. and what we have required B and Bs to get special permits, yep. and to have Board of Health inspections and, and some other things and that has not been required of Airbnb rentals. And so this is an attempt to bring the zoning up to speed. Um, it's my understanding that the Board of Health, we had had some of the safety inspections in our zoning and discovered that other towns really had those in a general bylaw, which makes a lot more sense because health and safety kinds of things should not be in the zoning, I don't think. So it's my understanding that the Board of Health will also be proposing a general bylaw that will address licensing and health and safety inspections, things like smoke detectors, number of egresses, yeah. um, license, state licenses, etc. Um, so this is just bringing the zoning up to speed. And basically what it's doing is saying for owner-occupied residences, the, the, essentially the requirements are the same as they are for B&Bs. Now with a B&B, uh, you don't have an unoccupied residence because that's a hotel okay. <laughs> and it falls elsewhere. So what we have added is a new section for single-family residences where, where there is no owner occupation. We introduced some requirements that they can't sublet it. You can't do this for more than four months a year, 120 days a year. We do not want to have people essentially running hotels right. in the guise of Airbnbs. Um, we are leaving up to the ZBA to determine how many occupants there can be under under this that that would we couldn't put it in the zoning it depends on the number of bedrooms the size of the bedrooms the you know the yeah. configuration and also associated with that the number of parking spots so so the special permit will determine yeah. how big it can be and and you can't really change the building basically it. So the, the Smike's house wouldn't come under this? No, this is for any rental less than 30 days. Uh, yeah, short-term uh, rental standard, is defined. This is short-term oh, okay, rental. Less than th okay, less so, than 30 so days. Okay. If, if you just rent your house for a year, does it come under this either or okay. for, yeah. for three months or something? Okay. This is for, for sh transient rentals. Basically, Airbnbs. And do both of these conditions exist today? Residents like this today? Do we have owner occupied or not owner occupied? Yes. Airbnbs? More than BBs, actually. Oh, yeah? Yeah. If you do a quick search for Waitley on any of these sites like Airbnb or VRBO or HomeAway, yeah. you, you will see some. Yeah, no, there was, there was a locations. story on the. Um, story on the news the other uh, the NPR did a story or the local NPR did a story about um, how the traditional B&Bs are starting to kind of overlap and use the, the yeah. online use that as one other of their marketing or, yeah. um, and throughout the Berkshires um, that, that was pretty common. So um, this is a way of in one sense protecting the B&Bs. Right. So we do have a couple of those yeah, I mean, it, it seems not unreasonable to, to have the same. More Airbnbs than Airbnbs. Right. <laughs> it doesn't seem unreasonable to have the same sort of health and uh, you know, 
health guidelines. No, you, yeah, the public health is something. And one of the changes in the state laws, you almost yeah. have to. Uh, yeah, that, the, the one question I know you'll get, and I, I know it won't get resolved tonight, is that um, I, I'm not alone in having an in-law apartment in my house. Yeah, I think we have to clarify and that. It does, and it's not clear here, and I know we're not going to resolve it tonight, no, but and maybe by the time we get the to the hearing, the public hearing I think there'll be... To, because... Because I, I, it, will, it will come up, is the thing. it's also true that that's what at least one of the current Airbnb rentals is, so, so yeah. it definitely has to be clarified. Yeah. So thank you for bringing that So, up. yeah, so that, that, that'll, that'll come up, but um, sounds like we don't have final wording. We're, to, we're here tonight not to approve or disapprove, this right? Update. The, this is a, a just an informational and keeping us up to date, which I really appreciate. Or, or the other condition, bringing up in-law apartments, there's some that are in separate buildings on the same parcel. Yeah. yeah, and one of our concerns, as it is with rental housing, is that affordable housing in this town is is hard to come by. And a lot of places have found that people are taking apartments and, that could be made generally available and using them for Airbnbs instead, and it's cutting into the to the stock of affordable housing. So. We need to try and draft something that gives people the opportunity to make use of this without taking away all our housing stock. And I kind of, we kind of deluded ourselves that we weren't in a high tourist area like the yeah. Berkshires, and it's not as bad as the Berkshires, but if I look at the number of Airbnbs, it's, yeah. it's higher than I thought it was. So, so it's convenient to a lot of places. The yeah. Airbnb site, is there, is there a fee or you have to, anybody get on or you? I have to oh. try to rent, I mean, obviously there's a fee that there's pays a fee. something. Yeah, no, yeah you, you, you just, you pay the, um, I've done it, uh, mostly traveling in Europe. Yeah. Um, well, you've done it from the visitor side. From the visitor side, right, yeah, so um, I've okay. not, yeah, I've not rented our place um, for, through Airbnb, but you go on and you can get some information to put in, you know, kind of your constraints and um, you actually pay right online with Airbnb um, and you show up and you get to stay at a place and sometimes it's awesome and sometimes it's not really as advertised so uh, so we've had a variety of experiences with it but uh, um, overall it's it seems to make sense I mean there was one time when I just I, I just needed a place to sleep that night in a town on short notice and somebody would rent me their bedroom for $25 in a town where a hotel room was $300. Mm -hmm. So they, it, it is definitely, you know, it's doing some good things out there right. for, for sure. But I don't think that particular case was taking something off of the rental market in that town. But I, I do know that it, there, are, there are problems in some cities where the, the housing stock is going away because people are, instead of renting apartments, uh, just doing short term well, rentals. We, we traveled to Salem. I was, I was flabbergasted at how yeah. many places that were around. The yeah. Country. So, anyhow, it's it's not to say they're good or bad, but they should uh, definitely have to go by the same sort of health and safety licensing as regular B and B's. And that doesn't seem to me to be controversial. I'm happy you're doing it. When you advertise for your public hearing. Will this be made available? People have seen before. Well, the final. This is just a. This is a. This is a This is for you guys. Okay. It's it's an intelligible language. <laughs> <laughs> I um, would agree. Peggy Sloan is getting us the final wording for the for the for the hearing. Right. Because I mean, online people will see it before the hearing, so they can. Of course. Yeah. Okay. Because you get more people interested that way if they have a chance, probably. To See it first. Okay. So are you, you basically done with this, or you have more meetings to? Well, other as, than the March, as Joyce to pointed out, we have to deal with this yeah, apartment yes. issue and, and multifamily things and work something out. But yeah, I think we are. We we approve 
conceptually a concept last night to take to the public hearing. So yeah, we're 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 ninety five percent of the way there. Okay. Okay. Well thank you so much for coming to update us. But well, we've got two more items. Can we get it done by eight o'clock, Fred? Sure. Okay. Um, the uh, probably the the review and discuss the select board's priority project list. And that okay. was one where I wasn't quite sure. Um, that's the one that looks like that in the back. Yeah. That's where is that? Yeah. Oh. Print them out a little bigger. Okay. That's what I tried to look at finding. Yeah. It was really small. I remember seeing one that was really small. Okay. This is a so this is the list that um, the board has that we've maintained, um, I think, before I started here. Um, it's seen different formats before, but I, I like this one because we can kind of see what's carried over yeah. and what comes off and what's added on. Um, so what's currently on the identified as higher priority is the town office renovations. And I'll, I'll give a quick, I guess, a quick synopsis yeah. of where we are. Okay. Um, so if you take a walk, right now King Information Systems is probably halfway through archiving all the records. Uh -huh. And those spaces are starting to look empty and it's looking great. Yeah. Um, so hopefully once we get all of our records cleaned up, we'll be able to move forward with um, figuring out those additional offices that are gonna, that are gonna go in here. Is okay. there room in a vault for everything that needs to be in there? Yeah, I, I, th I think a good majority of this stuff can be legally disposed of at this point in accordance with the retention records. But there's okay. permanent records we have to keep. But, are, are, but the shelving is in the vault and... Are, are they going through and, and disposing stuff? They are right marking, today? yep. Oh, they're marking. We're identifying and marking it for disposal. Okay. We have a shredding, a shredding company. Okay. Um, the driveway permit revisions have there really hasn't been a push on that. Um, oh. Really, one I guess. Um, I guess just before I started here, there was some meeting with John Robleski and yeah. Keith, and I don't know, Fred, if you were yeah, involved. I was involved. Um, so, yeah. But those have just kind of slid down the list. I haven't right. heard of any uh -huh. issues that would require that to, I guess, move to the. On the top of the heap, manganese treatment system. That's Obviously, that's very important. That is, um, yeah. And um, we have a signed contract with uh, Dan Chris Builders Corporation to install that. Um, I think they're waiting for the, the ground to thaw a little bit. Um, right. And then they'll get, get that project underway. Um, but it should be done by, it should be done sometime before the end of the summer, I would think. They have 180 days from. January to on the contract, so yep. barring any unforeseen circumstances, that should that should be up and running. Um, townhouse to renovation project. Um, that I would say that's 99.9% .9 done. There's some there's still a couple punch list items to do, um, and then there's some warranty items that we're asking the contractor to uh, take care of. One of them being some of the exterior storm windows. Um, have some pink staining. Oh, on the outside, it seems to be that the glass is delaminate. Uh, some of the, oh, it's the delaminated coating. a little bit. Oh. Coating. The coating. Um, so that's clearly uh, uh, a, a manufacturing warranty. defect, yeah. and we not we don't have any pushback in terms of that being replaced. Okay. Um, Williamsburg Road Bridge replacement. Um, the project was approved by the Conservation Commission, so <coughs> there's. A, there's a notice of intent that's been reviewed. Um, the engineering is pretty much done. So we'll be looking for that project to go off the bid um, probably okay. in the next couple months. Okay. Um, water systems merger, that's um, continuing to move forward. Yeah. Hopefully we'll have a proposal from from the merger committee. Yeah. Um, and, and that will hopefully be on this on annual this town, town meeting. meeting. Yeah. Um, IT upgrades to town offices. Um, the one thing remaining is um, I'd like to try to 
I'd like to have some more reliable um, automated backup of our systems. Um, we've consolidated okay. emails onto, everybody has a waitly.org email address now. Yeah. Um, we have upgraded our router, so we the router and the firewall, and we have the wireless um, in this building. So okay. there's a little bit more to do there. Whitley Elementary School sprinklers, we covered those. Yeah. Um, capital planning, we're kind of trying to take, well, the, the capital planning committee is trying to, yeah. is working on that. Um, and it's, we're, we're starting to make some, yeah. some progress. Yeah. Some better long range planning of our facilities. Recreational marijuana, that's, that's really ongoing. Um, and we're, we're taking it as it comes, which reminds me that, right, there's a community outreach meeting yes, that Friday. has been scheduled by um, a company that is interested in opening a retail marijuana establishment at 13 State Road. That's the old bookstore, I'm told. Yep. And so there's a community outreach meeting Friday, March 1st at 6 p.m. at location at 13 yep. State Road. And that is a meeting that's required for the applicant to hold. It's not a town requirement or a town run meeting. It's required by the Cannabis Control Commission yep. um, for the applicant to hold that meeting. So, uh, Blue School Lot Disposition and Ball Field Relocation. We've done the, the, the disposition part. Yeah. And I know Jonathan's working on uh, a possible um, ball field replacement either at Hurley Heat Park or um, at, the at the elementary school. Yeah. So um, Comcast slash FCAT hookup. We think Comcast is hooked up. We just need to yeah, we need equipment. move the ball forward yeah, yeah, on the yeah. equipment. Um, so those are ones that we had as high priority on the list. Um, my recommendations to the board would be the workplace safety OSHA compliance is something that we'll need yeah. to focus on over the next year or two in terms of catching up with training and those types of things. Um, Chestnut Plain uh, Road sidewalk reconstruction. Uh, we have the money for that and we approved the design work tonight. Yeah. Um, center school reuse or sale. That one used to, that one was listed as a low priority. I'm suggesting that yeah. we move it up now that the building, now that it's empty. Yeah. Now that it's empty. And then I wasn't really sure where to put the municipal um, aggregation. We sort of don't have a lot of control over that, do we? It's the process is the, the process is, is yeah. yeah. So uh, it doesn't matter that much where we put it; it's going to happen at its own pace. So, um, so I don't object to having it in a higher priority. Just acknowledging that we don't have that much push. I mean, it's they did have a, a major meeting uh, early earlier this week. I think it was now. The, the aggregation meeting. When was that? Was that last, last week? Thursday? Last Thursday. So I mean, it's moving. It's moving a pace, but yeah, uh, a DPU's uh, pace. So. A, a DPU pace, right? Um, so do you want me to yeah. keep going on the medium okay. ones? Yeah, sure. We can talk yeah. about sure. Yeah, they look. Uh, what you had so far looks fine. So medium priority is the 250th anniversary committee, which has been formed and meeting. Um, solar projects. I think this was when solar projects electricity purchase when, right. when we were involved in the facility in Chicopee. Right, uh, right. There are some other options that we're looking into. It's kind of, yeah. I guess it's kind of relevant again. I, I would move that up higher. I, I think yeah. okay. it's, it's time we get serious about solar for, for town town uses, town buildings. Yeah. Let's move and that up. maybe you want to, if you want a municipal aggregation, well, Um, Hayden, so uh, I'll write in that. We'll move that up. Okay. Uh, Haydenville Road, Mountain Street reconstruction. Um, we saw the preliminary environmental uh, um, impact plan, what, maybe a month ago or two months ago. Um, but that's, that's almost, <coughs> I think that project will be moving more slowly than others, really out of our control as it goes through the mass DOT planning process or engineering process because it is with uh, state funding. Yeah. 
Poplar Hill Road, Poplar Hill Road extension, or um, it's really what it's street acceptance or extension yeah. of the street acceptance. Um, we've, we've, Keith and I have met with uh, the neighbor, Mr. Creasy, and, Smith, and Charlie Conan from Smith College and they are now preparing a street acceptance plan for the board to consider which would extend Poplar Hill Road which was for some reason discontinued um, short of the, the Smith College parking lot. Um, I'm told it was a Scribner's error. I don't, we don't really know what happened but it's, it, it got discontinued at a point that's okay. not advantageous for the town or Smith or Mr. Creasy. So. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> that or Veterans Monument Project we know about that. Um, yep. DeMaio property is still sitting out there. Frontier Capital Planning and Bond, I, I guess really the work of that is probably done. Um, it's just whether it's yeah. funded or not. Yeah. Um, the things that I would like to do but can never seem to find time to do are, are to take a comprehensive look at our personnel policies um, and also yeah. the job descriptions because as we've seen right, yeah. these positions have sort of evolved and, and our descriptions we don't have their job different. descriptions are so things things. are called associate or assistant <coughs> and we have police sergeant but we have full time it's I yeah. think it just needs to get yeah. a good once over um, and then there's some discussions surrounding um, Tritown Beach yes at this yes. point um, so I think we just need to keep that on our radar. Okay. Uh, and just lower priority ideas. One was regional police, um, the highway department building, and sort of <coughs> long-term plan of that facility is something I get, it's on my mind at least. Yeah. Long-term, in terms of long-term planning. Generator project for the elementary school. Um, it's a low priority, but it's almost done, so yep. that'll, that should come off there. Hurley Park dugout issue. Um, I bet John's not here. Heard much on that. And then yeah. I wanted to hopefully put this on the list at some point. We agreed to, with Conway to um, have a study done as to <coughs> whether it makes sense for a shared human resources person yeah. um, to exist somewhere in the county that can be a resource to the towns for maybe personnel policy revisions yeah, or job, descri yeah, or job maybe description or job description um, but okay. those, that's what's on the list or what I could think of as yeah oh and I skipped the cemetery stone rehabilitation <coughs> that's, that's sort of that's funded that's, through the CPA right and that's sort of happening in phases yeah. right that's funded and yeah. under contract it's yeah. the weather they're waiting for the springtime to Where, where does the uh, complete streets the application fall on this? Is, should that be on here somewhere or not? So, so there's not, a, I mean, no, wait a minute, not complete streets. I mean the uh, green communities. Well, we do currently don't have any green communities projects. Do we have green communities money left? No. Didn't we, okay. didn't we submit or ask to submit something? <coughs> not yet. There's an, open, there's an open grant round now. Right, okay. okay. Well, so if we if we got some more information regarding uh, solar projects for municipal electricity, that might give us an opportunity to write uh, a grant for green communities again. It could. I I I thought I read something that they're not. They don't give a high score to solar PV generation. I'd have to double check. Oh, okay. But I yeah. think that. Oh, okay. Understood. I think they're trying. But we should think, yeah, so we should keep that in energy. the back of our mind. I think they're trying to focus on my quick read of, of what they were looking for was more energy conservation. Um, oh, okay. But but I also read something about, we'll have to look at it. Yeah. But I asked, there's also something about sort of energy conservation, energy storage. Uh, oh. But maybe it's energy storage related to PV, I'm solar PV, I'm not sure. Yeah. The, the, the other other thing, uh, I guess I mentioned a couple of times, is the uh, I guess working with FERCOG on the the intersection project, which 
Christian Lane and State Road. Yep. Uh, where would we put that on here? Medium priority, high priority? That seems like the kind of thing that's really hard for us um, to push. We don't have a lot of leverage to push on that. So. To push what, for a cog? Uh, or to push anybody to actually do something about the intersection. Because well, I, the kinds of things that you need to do to make it safer are so expensive. And uh, then given the traffic on there, there's always going to be someplace else in the state the owner, that's, the that's got more, uh, you know, lives per mile or whatever the units are right, you know so so and, and, and as a select board we don't have a lot of leverage to do something so I don't know if that affects where we put it well but it, it's it's been a high uh, the number one priority in the county until they do their latest survey and that's that's one of the reasons that I guess I think it's a, it's appropriate time to bring it up with FERCOG because it's still on the top of the list or will be near the top. And and I think we could use their expertise to, to do some coordination. I, I would I would hate to, to not do anything because of costs now. We have no idea what the costs are. I mean, the, there's stuff that has been done to, since it was number one on the list and, and that doesn't seem to correct everything that needs to be done. Uh, no, no, I, I understand and, that. And but we got to start somewhere. It's, it's not going to be a one or two year project. It may take longer uh, to get something going. But and there's there's a lot of there's several agencies that need to be involved in that. And and to me, it's it's a, a good effort for for Cog to get involved and start the coordination. Yeah, they're not going to do the design or funding maybe of it, but. The, to get involved in coordinating and get people at the table to talk about it. That's that's my interest right now. Yeah, I, I have no idea what the costs are or, or who's going to fund it and all, but I, I, we shouldn't uh, not look at it because of that, because of the unknowns. We don't know that. Uh, and there, th that's why I, I think it's it's something that, that the town should get involved in with FERCOG. Well, the other option is, is I guess, Brian's time, and, and we've got these other priorities on here that I think are more important than have for Brian to do. Uh, well, yeah, the, I, I guess, so bang, bang for buck for bang per unit of Brian's work, a lot of these other projects will be, I'm not saying we shouldn't put it on here, right. but I don't think it should go in a high priority. No, well, then maybe medium priority, then, I, I think. Yeah, and I don't you know the distinction between medium and low is not that much. Yeah. Uh, I don't know what the distinction is. Well, but, but at least put it on somewhere then yeah. to keep reminding us like that, that it I might, think that's yeah, a It might be more uh, realistic than regionalizing the police, so maybe it goes to medium. <laughs> uh, I heard that went well. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I, so, okay, what I if we add it to medium priority? Medium priority. Christian Lane Routes 5 and 10 yeah. intersection. Okay. Yeah. Safety or improvements. Yeah, and I, I don't want to drag things out too much more because I know I, uh, people have to get going. The center school, uh, basically, we bought ourselves four months uh, worth of insurance right. at the last finance committee meeting. Um, and so, basically, that $1,500 of insurance was for four months. So on a yearly basis, that would be 4,500 a year. And then do you have a, a rough idea of what it costs us in heat and electricity for those? Is it of a similar order of magnitude? Is it in the thousands of dollars or is this an ad in the hundreds of dollars? Um. I think if we were to continue eating it, I think we'd be talking in the thousands of dollars. Okay. Throughout the year with electricity. Yeah. So it yeah. would would ten thousand dollars a year be a a reasonable estimate of what we have to pay just to keep it from crumbling? I think ten would be a little bit high, but but eight to ten. Eight. Uh, and that's like 
after a couple of months, your heat's going to be Yeah, I think long. after a little while, we'll, we'll, right, but it'll just be in the winter. The cost, I think the cost will be in the winter. In the winter. Right, but, but, but I you just average, it over, average it over a year. So I don't know what a heating season, that's I guess the, what is the heating cost over the course of the season? Yeah. So, um, it, so somewhere between five and $10,000 per year is what we have to pay to not do anything. Oh, you're including insurance. Including the insurance, oh yeah, you have to include the insurance. Yes. Oh, I know, it's because yeah. we have to pay Sorry. the insurance, we have to pay the heat, we have to pay the electricity. Yeah. Um, the, Presumably, so, we keep it what, presumably we're doing that so we maintain yeah. the building in a saleable condition. You know, that would be my assumption. Yeah. So any water intrusion or leaks or anything we're going to want to address because right. that's going to damage the building. So. so so that's using round numbers, $10,000 a year is what we, and you know people have to go with, have, Keith is going to take some time to go visit that uh, our community custodian would be coming in, the people coming in to visit to make sure that you know, that isn't flooded and things like that. So um, that's, I think, an important number for people to have out there um, when it comes time to to decide. And we really have to get ideas out there about, and it, it has come up here that, you know, we, it, it's not a building that's ever gonna be energy efficient. Um, it's never gonna be handicap accessible uh, without huge, huge major investments that are going to change the historical character of the building. And this this is one where, I, this might be really controversial, and people who grew up here and went to school in that building will probably all hate me, but we probably should look at at what it would cost to demolish the building safely. That should be something we look at, because if it's, it may be hundreds of thousands or a million dollars to do it, but then we need to compare that to the $10,000 a year it costs us now, and let's have some real things to make a decision based on. And that should not be the only option we look into. Right. Um, that, you know, I, I don't know how to get the ball rolling on other things, like you know, listing it as a saleable property. But boy, that lot that it's sitting on is, I think, really a valuable lot for, um, for municipal use, for a park, for uh, a, an event space, uh, you know, daytime events. So there's, I, I would really hate to see it go and become a little restaurant uh, with all that land there uh, that could be kind of for the general public to use better than we're using it now. But, but I think that's really important for people to hear. $10,000 a year approximately is what it costs us to do nothing we should be looking into what the other options are. And they might be too expensive, but we should at least look at them. Well, yeah. I, I think it's more saleable property the way it is. Yeah, well, with the building on it. With the building on it. Right. You're, you're giving people an option to do something with it. And they all can always uh, tear down the building and put something new if they determine that's better use of a, of a lot. I, I guess I would hate to see us demolish the building and then put the lot for sale or... Oh, I, see that's to me no, that well, I would not put the tunnels. lot up for sale. If we demolished it then we decide what to do with it. And maybe for a while it just has a small parking lot and a very simple park. But it's, it's, uh, it's a beautiful site uh, and it's one that I think, you know, that milk bottle isn't going anywhere. It could be Milk Bottle Park. Um, it could be great. But you also got to got to yeah. look at its relation to the, I guess, the center of town and other attractions there, and how. Oh yeah. How will it be used? I mean, and, and if we're building sidewalks there to connect it. I mean, right now, no, nobody uses a sidewalk. Well, I shouldn't say nobody, but it's difficult to use it. I haven't been on it, but yeah. because it's it's not maintained in the wintertime, so yep. uh, it's only going to be seasonal use. Uh, right. I, I, I think there's there's sentiment. I went to school there. Yep. Like both schools I, I went to. Uh, I, I, I guess I have some sentimental value to it, I, I guess. Uh, you know, our other school is in Springfield now, <laughs> West, Spring, West, West Springfield, I guess, our, our first school. Uh, I guess I hate to see these buildings demolished 
or, or you know, we're trying to, the, the blue school is, is hopefully going to be re redeveloped and the facade is going to stay the same pretty much. So what we've been told, yeah. we'll, we'll see what happens. So, so that should probably yeah. be an option we should look at too as yeah. well. So anyways, I wanted to just put, put that out there as, as a, a really good reason for this to move from medium to high priority is the money we spend every year to to just not do anything yeah. with it. Well, the, the biggest yeah. cost, well, right now nothing will happen until after town meeting probably. Yeah. Uh, then the biggest cost you're looking for, other than insurance, is the heating in what November, I guess you'd say. So you'd have from May through November to decide what we want to do with it, I guess. But it, but from May to November, you'll be paying insurance, right? To the tune of of four thousand four thousand five hundred per year. So prorated, that's another six months. Six months, so two thousand dollars, twenty five hundred dollars. Yeah. 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 Right. So so it's. It, you know, each each time we put off something, it's ching 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 ching. Right. Okay, but but then I could bring up the fact that you know Demio property is sitting there. We're not advertising it for sale. Right. It's a commercial property. I mean, we're probably losing more money by not selling but, that than right. Than but trying to sell but we're commercial. not paying anything to keep it. No. We're right. Not paying okay. Money. So no, I, I I'm not. I'm just it's saying. The lost tax this is we yeah. we've kind of batted it around a lot we right. really have to get that sorted out right for ten thousand dollars a year i think we can sort it out i like the school we are i have no sentimental value whatsoever <laughs> <laughs> for anything or just the school no, I okay. all right well we do have one last agenda item uh, so discuss a request to support SD 2292, an act ensuring fair funding for rural schools. <coughs> so, Brian, do you have a... I'm wondering if... So, I guess my question is, shall I prepare a letter of support for the board to sign that would uh, support S, whatever that number was? Uh, 2292. An um, act ensuring fair funding for rural schools. And... Um, under this proposal that's uh, been submitted, um, it would um, it would be an adjustment to the um, um, to the Chapter 70 formula that would include a um, a rural I forget what they call it um, right, a, uh, a, I, I'm not going a rurality factor. I'm not even sure if that's a word, but it would include a, an adjustment to the Chapter 70 formula to uh, provide additional money to rural schools. Um, and I think there was $9 million attached to this funding, and that would be an increase for $235 per student. So there's a, there's a the chart that the board has, and I mean a table that the board has. So for Waitley, if this were to pass, it would be an additional um, Thirty-six thousand um, dollars that would be added each year um, to the to a right. chapter seventy-eight. Yeah, it's, it's total. It's not per pupil. That's it? total. total. It's total. Yeah. Right. Which presumably would would vary as the number of pupils. So it it impacts most most. Um, I mean, we we'll run through these towns. We're looking at towns in Western Mass and the Cape. Yeah. Um, I think as a broad. Over generalization, right. but it's, it's those towns who small increases to the chapter seventy money don't necessarily help very much. If they yeah. add five dollars per student to up to right. us, that's an additional what six hundred um, seven hundred dollars right. right. total. It doesn't. Yeah. But if you add five dollars to a, a, a larger school of <clears throat> yeah, the ten thousand kids. Yeah, then then our district that has ten thousand kids. Not you. Yeah, have a PE teacher. Or um, uh, so it, it's meant to address that. So we could propose a letter and send it to. Yeah. We could compose a letter and send it to the governor or representatives. And yeah, suggesting I, that. I, I I think we should probably uh, sign on. It's better than not uh, signing on. I think. I don't know that uh, we'll actually get. 
I mean, it, in the end, this whole, yeah, after 73 uh, reform, I guess, probably, uh, will all depend on if they actually put more real money in. Because if they don't put more real money in, then it's probably a zero sum game, and other places can make probably better arguments for needs for the money based on some things that, you know. <laughs> that, yeah. that wouldn't really affect us. Or, yeah, so a, it's probably good for us to do it. So I think we should do it. We should get the letter written up and we can chat more about it as it happens. But I, mean, I don't see any downside for us to sign a, a letter encouraging this. No, sure. That sounds good. Yeah. Okay. Go along with that. Yeah. All right. So that's settled. Is there anything else from? Brian, under town administrator updates. I'll say we covered most. I said we covered everything on the priority projects. Okay. Um, we covered the biggest thing was I wanted to just get the news about the community. Yeah. Um, community outreach meeting that's happening on Friday. Okay. Out. So. Okay. Items not anticipated. All done. I would entertain a motion to adjourn. Make a motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye.